My name is Dave Pear, and uh, Robert Lee uh, and I started uh, the blog eight years ago. It's called DavePear.com. And uh, what Robert Lee has done for retired players, he's really, he's one of the reasons why we're here, <clears throat> because of the internet. Uh, so now, we're all talking to each other. And prior to that, <clears throat> we just cried in our beer. But uh, <clears throat> the internet has changed the game. And instead of going from the top down, it goes from the bottom up. And I've been fighting for my disability benefits since 1979. Broke my neck, played two years with a broken neck, <clears throat> applied for the line of duty. I was 59% disabled. <clears throat> in 83, I was denied the benefit. I tried again, and, uh, and, 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 and that was the qualification of being 59% disabled. <clears throat> in 95, I applied again. I was rated 80% or more disabled. I mean, th that's the largest box you can check. And the NFL doctor wrote, I need to rest frequently on the job. And I was denied again. So, and I was told I could do sedentary work. And I've asked, what is sedentary work? Well, <clears throat> I never got an answer. John Hogan, and that's why the blog was started, is because of the disability debacle. And along with disability are pensions. John Hogan is a disability expert, and John has been uh, <clears throat> gracious enough to explain to anybody that would listen what ERISA law requires and what it doesn't require, and what's legal and what's not legal. And it seems that the NFL, they do whatever they want. The NFLPA has already been convicted in federal court of breaching their fiduciary duty in the player's ink trial, uh, and also breach a contract. And they're equally guilty, they're equally culpable of the same crime on disability. And they just haven't been brought into court yet, quite frankly, because there's so many issues. I mean, we have the NFL films, workers' comp, we have uh, concussions. Th that, that's a huge issue. I mean, the NFL is afraid of, they're terrified of this because this could change the game. I mean, the game almost went away in the early 1900s due to the brutality. And then Heisman, you know, invented the forward pass. He saved the game. But now it's gone full circle. And these concussions, I mean, it's, it's a mess. And fortunately, you know, we have lawyers here. That, that's who we need. We need lawyers that understand the law, lawyers that aren't ambulance chasers, lawyers that can actually um, hey, we all need to get paid, but they have to be, you know, willing <clears throat> to step up, have a deep pocket, and fight the fine fight. Because it, I mean, we're taking on a monster. The NFL is a monster. And now that we have some really good attorneys, um, the game has changed. And uh, we still need the players involved, but there's so much misinformation out there about what certain groups do and what certain groups don't do. And there's just so much confusion, and that's what the NFL really wants. And uh, we have in, you know, we bicker amongst ourselves about, I do this, I do that. Um, then you look at who's getting paid for doing what, and just follow the paycheck, and that'll pretty much tell you, uh, you can't slap the hand that feeds you. Now, I'd just like to talk a few minutes about disability, because that is really, my concern is disability. Um, currently, as John Hogan has pointed out, the disability, they allow doctors. When you go see an NFL doctor, they allow that doctor to decide whether, you're, uh, whether you can work or not. He allows that doctor to make employment decisions, and the doctor is not trained as a vocational specialist. The vocational aspect in disability is totally missing. And when that happens, you have no choice. They say you can go do sedentary work. What does that mean? The panel, you got three retired players, you have three owners, and you got Roger Goodell. Now we all know Roger Goodell has come out in the past. He's not even sure he's the chairman. Okay, so that's, that's his concern. The three players, retired players, that are on the vote, that they're voting members, have zero training on disability. They don't understand disability law. They're not qualified, but they allow them to make decisions. In fact, 
Jeff Van Note works for the Falcons. He works for the NFL. Robert Smith is an announcer for the NFL. Sam McCollum uh, is Dave Duerson's replacement. And those are Sam's words. I'm Duerson's replacement. Sam doesn't understand legacy, the legacy, CBA. I mean, what is the legacy? Who understands it? If, if you call anybody and ask them, they don't even know. They're still working on it. You know, you have to ask someone like John Hogan. Uh, he can explain, as an attorney, what he understands it to be, but nobody knows. There's players that haven't received their legacy checks yet. They haven't received, you know, now they give severance pay. They haven't received their severance pay. Who do you call? Because your union doesn't represent you. Sure, they're a little kinder now, but the reality is the same smiling faces are still there. And then you look at, uh, <clears throat> we've all heard of Tom Condon. Well, Tom Condon is a, a big time sports agent. For 25 years, Tom Condon sat on the disability board. He was also Gene Upshaw's agent. So my question is, how did Tom Condon vote when his clients came before the disability board? That's a conflict of interest. That's a huge conflict of interest. Well, when Tom stepped down before uh, Dave Duerson shot himself and committed suicide, Dave would do anything he thought Gene Upshaw wanted him to do so he could get a real job with the NFLPA. And he turned down a lot of players saying that this head injury thing wasn't real. Well, we all know what happened to Dave when Dave realized that the train was coming at him and he was in the same position as, a, as the players that he turned down, he shot himself. What do the lawyers that represent the plan say? We have Doug L. Doug L. is the, uh, the lead plan, he, he, he's the lead attorney <clears throat> for, the, uh, <clears throat> for the Burt Bell, Pete Rosell plan. He says, despite whatever impairments Dave may experience at times, he still demonstrated mental sharpness far in excess of the average person. So now, you got lawyers, no disrespect to the attorneys in here, making decisions that a clinical psychologist with a PhD in the United States, not in Guadalajara, the type that the NFL wants to put in there, making this mental decisions it, you know, it's just, and it's just outrageous. And John Hogan had, had mentioned that the United States Department of Labor audit. I mean, that would expose what's going on. Because the NFLPA and the Burt Bell Roselle plan, they make their own rules up. They make it up as they go. And there's no standard. If you take a look at, uh, <clears throat> Several years ago, I was giving Roger Goodell such a bad time, he actually called me. Called him 14 times in four days. Now that may be a little bit aggressive, but he, uh, I wanted to make sure he called me. Well, he called me and uh, he wanted to make it a PR call. He wanted to start talking about uh, how he returns his phone calls. And I says, Roger, you know, uh, is it okay if we move on and we just talk about the issues? Because yeah, I don't want to waste your time talking about phone calls. At the end of the 25 minute conversation, because I made him listen to my grievance. 25 minutes, I made him listen to my grievance. At the 25 minutes, he was so exasperated. He said, who do you think I am, God? I said, no, Roger, you're not God. You're the commissioner of the National Football League. And you're charged, it's your job to maintain the integrity. So he sent me a lawyer named Larry Lomedy. Larry Lomedy's worked for the league for 40 years. Four, four months later, we catch Larry sending us anonymous threats on the blog. My editor, Robert Lee, traces the anonymous email back. It came out of Larry Lomedy's office. Friends, that's what the NFL, that's, that's the respect that the NFL has for you. And they've been getting away with it. But there's so much information out there now. There's so many lawsuits. Parents are asking themselves, should I let my child play? Well, football is a dangerous sport. And we need benefits, and right now we don't have them. 
And then at the end of the, uh, of the article, it says, Executive Director of the NFL Players Association, D. Smith, had no comment. Okay, so that's your union. We don't have a union. We don't have anything except us. We have these lawyers in here. The only way we're gonna get any kind of justice, we got three ways. Class action and mass action lawsuits, the court of public opinion, and Congress. Anything less, if we're waiting for the NFL or the NFLPA to do the right thing, it's not gonna happen. They're waiting for us all to die, especially the pre-1993 players. And hey, this isn't about sour grapes. For those of you who had to listen to me speak in the past, I used to get angry, and I really worked at controlling that anger, because once you get angry, you turn people off. People don't want, everybody has problems. So we have to present ourselves and talk to, uh, talk about the issues, and we gotta continue to fight on for justice, because the NFL is not gonna do anything unless they have to do it. And in my opinion, these concussion lawsuits are a real game changer. They're a real game changer. And so, uh, you know, get educated. Find out what the real issues are. Because if you go to an NFL PA meeting, they just had done a Marco Island, you can play a little golf, exchange a few business cards, they're gonna tell you all the good things they're doing. You go home, that's what you get. There's nothing there. The NFL alumni, we all know what's happened to them recently. George Martin filed bankruptcy three times in 15 years, gave all the, uh, the business opportunities to his family. I mean, that's just disgraceful. I mean, that's what they're giving you guys, and they know that the majority of retired players don't have a clue what's going on. And in the past, we just take what they give us. But we can't do that anymore. We have to, we have to demand that everything be out in the open. We have to demand justice, and we have to demand what they owe us. We don't want any charity. I don't want charity from anybody. But I do want what you owe me. I've spent $600,000 of my own money on medical bills. $600,000. That's what I made as a player. In the last uh, five years, I qualified for Medicare. That's another 300,000. And nine weeks ago, I had a hip replacement. It's another 70,000. Guess who the NFL has asked to pay for that? Taxpayers, they don't want to pay for it. So you ever wonder why Medicare and Social Security are going broke? This is one reason. They're trying to take away workers' comp. They don't want you to get your workers' comp claim. As Robert said, they don't want to pay for stealing your images. They say when you get hit in the head, you know, there was a doctor. His name was Ira Casson. He sat on the uh, mild traumatic uh, concussion and brain injury committee for about 16 years. And a couple years ago, he made the outrageous statement that there's no scientific evidence that repeated blows of the head cause brain damage. He was asked by a reporter, and we put it on our blog, four times about brain injuries that's getting hit in the head cause brain damage. He said, no, 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 no. We named him Dr. No. Well, Dr. No is no longer here. We don't know where he's at. But the NFL's answer is, is okay, so what we'll do is, we'll change the name. So now it's called the, the Neck, Back, Spine, and Shoulder Committee. And the disability benefits, instead of called total and permanent, they call them inactive A and inactive B. They just keep changing it on you. It's like a chess game. Because 
The vast majority of players didn't understand the first set. Now we're on to the second set. So they rather pay lawyers to confuse it, their lawyers, instead of paying you your benefits. But as these lawsuits keep mounting, they have to do something because it's really giving the NFL a black eye. So my motive has been disability. It will continue to be disability because the disability in the NFL right now is a debacle. It's a fraud. There's no standards. For 25 years, Gene Upshaw said that a player cannot receive a pension and a disability benefit. That's what the executive director of the NFLPA said for 25 years. Then about four years ago, his own lawyer, Lanny Davis, said, after Michael Leahy asked him in the Washington Post, are you sure? Gene says, yes, I'm sure. Lenny Davis says, that's not the law. It's discretionary. That's the NFLPA. And we bought it all these years. So all I can say is we've got to stand up to these bullies. It's not going to be easy. And we can't back down. Because at the end of the day, they're going to have to pay their bill. But in the meantime, a lot of players keep dying. One just died, I want to say died, committed suicide in Atlanta, I think yesterday. Last year, 152 players died. So the more these players die off, the less, the less, the less claims they're going to pay. And as far as pre-1993 players and what I see in here, Every player that's here is a pre-1993, if I'm wrong, correct me. They don't care about you. As far as they're concerned, you already did. They don't plan on paying you a penny. So I thank all the law firms that are here. Thank uh, the Hosfeld Group. I thank Jason Lukasevic. I thank uh, Bob Stein and his group for NFL Films, John Hogan, Ron Mix. There's so many lawyers here, you know, and I just appreciate it. And all I can say is, is thank you. Thank you for uh, those who are able to uh, make a contribution to our nonprofit. Somebody has to pay for this. You know, NFL doesn't pay me anything. They don't like me very much because I expose them who they are. So we truly are independent. We just want to tell you what's going on. So thank you for listening, and uh, I look forward to speaking with you individually. Come on, Brian. OK, we're going to get into our discussion. Um, first, we're reversing everything. We're going to reverse the first two. Uh, Ron Mix, many of you already know. Ron's been there, done that. He's played professional football, gotten beat up, been all over the place. Now Ron's uh, been very successful as a California workers' compensation attorney. Um, we've also got Brian, Brian Round. Brian, you are from, I'm trying to remember your state. Missouri. Brian has been from Kansas, Brian's from Kansas City, Missouri. He's been representing quite a few players out of uh, Kansas City. Um, and he's also worked fairly closely with the alumni group there as well to uh, try to get some changes and, and move things along in that state. Um, what we want to do is, you know, have them talk a little bit about what they've done, what they do, and then segue this into the, uh, some of the current stuff that's been going on with uh, the fights with the NFL and the NFLPA for workers' comp and some of the strategies that they're trying to throw back on you guys. So with that, I'll just let these guys tell you what's been going on. Thank you, Robert, Dave. My name is Brian Round. I'm an attorney in Kansas City. I do a lot of workers' compensation. Primarily that is for professional athletes. It's my pleasure and privilege to be here with you all today. When I usually give this speech, it's with a group of current players. Most of them don't pay much attention. 
They're talking on their phones, they're texting their friends, they're sleeping. This benefit, this workers' compensation benefit, really doesn't resonate with them because they're receiving their big game checks and they don't recognize how important it is to avail yourself of your workers' compensation rights. Uh, I suspect that this group is going to be a lot more attentive than uh, the guys I usually speak to. And I tell them that when you can't pass or catch or tackle or block anymore, you're nothing but a liability to the team. You don't hear how great you are. You don't hear what an asset you are to the team. You don't get your phone calls returned. And what you have is a big fight to get the benefits that you're entitled to. They ask you, why are you doing this? You knew football was a tough sport. You knew you might get hurt. Most of the players certainly most of the players in this room, probably didn't even know that they were entitled to workers' compensation benefits when they played the game. And if you did know, you got the whole tough guy talk from the trainers, from the coaches, from the front office. And most of the players in the era that you guys come from didn't file work comp. Fortunately, the culture is that many more are filing for workers' compensation now, and that's a good thing. Um, you're not looked down. You're not looked on as being inferior, as being some kind of a sissy for filing work comp because it's your right. And there's nothing wrong, there's nothing um, about being a sissy for availing yourself of your rights. And workers' compensation is a right. It derives from the state law in every state of the union. Whether you're from California or Missouri or Florida or New York, they have workers' compensation laws. And those workers' compensation laws protect NFL employers, NFL employees, like all you were, the same as it protects the guy who's flipping burgers at McDonald's. You're both employees. The laws apply to each of you uh, equally. In a workers' compensation case, you're generally entitled, entitled to two main benefits. The first is a monetary award. And given the right set of circumstances, the second is future medical care. With respect to uh, establishing, proving your case, you have to prove that you have a disability. So what you would do is, in effect, baseline yourself at 100% the day before your injury. Once you have gone through your surgeries, done your rehab, healed up as best you can, you are going to be 80% of that, 70% of it, 90% of it, whatever the case may be. And when you establish that there's a disability, then your benefits kick in. Um, obviously, some injuries are easier to quantify than others. Um, if you tear your ACL, um, you may have uh, objective evidence that you have a loss of range of motion. Uh, your, your speed may be down. Your quickness may be uh, compromised. Um, there are, those kind of injuries are easier to quantify than, say, a concussion. Because, especially with you guys, um, there's no baseline. If you didn't have an MRI of your brain prior to your time when you begin playing, it's very difficult to say that these injuries are 10% or 20%. You're, the, the, the science is getting better. And that's part of what the concussion lawsuits are all about to promote the science and develop the science. Um, but there are injuries that are more difficult to, to prove than others. The second thing with respect to um, workers' compensation laws that you need to be very cognizant of 
are statutes of limitations. A statute of limitations is a part of the law that says you have to file your claim within so many years of the date of your injury, and every state's different. Uh, the date of the injury, the date of your medical care, whether that is a surgery, whether that's rehabilitation, whatever the case may be. But if you miss the statute of limitations, then you can never file that claim again. You're done. It's a drop dead date. Um, in Missouri, it's two years if the employer files a first report of injury, it's three years if they don't. Chiefs have gotten very smart and they are um, filing first reports of injury on uh, a jammed finger. A uh, receiver jams his finger, they're filing a first report of injury. They are doing everything in their power to limit their exposure. And I suspect that every other team in the league is doing the same thing. Um, so you have to be very mindful uh, of those statutes of limitations. Um, it's very important for you and for the guys that you talk to, the guys you stay in touch with, to make sure that you do get an, a competent attorney. Like Dave said, um, you need one who's well versed and familiar with the NFL collective bargaining agreement uh, and the various arbitrations that interpret that uh, agreement. And not just any attorney is qualified. You don't get a uh, brain surgeon to work on your knee. In the same respect, you don't get a divorce lawyer to handle your workers' compensation. And then even further, you don't just get any workers' compensation lawyer to handle NFL claims because they are so uh, exacting and there are so many nuances to those claims. Typically, workers' compensation cases are handled on a contingent fee basis. That means the attorney um, gets his fee from whatever he or she recovers for you. And if there's no recovery, you would own a fee. So in effect, there's really no downside. You and the attorney become business partners. The more the attorney gets for you, the more the attorney gets paid. They have an incentive to maximize the recovery. I'm going to talk just briefly about California, and Ron will speak much more about that. But as I stated earlier, uh, statute limitations and benefits in each state are different. And the benefits in some states are obviously better than the benefits in others. It's not so great to get hurt in the state of Missouri or Texas, maybe Florida. It's probably better if you had to choose a place where you're going to be injured to be injured in California or Minnesota. Um, many players have really gotten wise to these things. George, for instance, uh, Ron filed his own claim. Um, they've gotten wise and they've begun to file these claims in the state of California. California has really good benefits. Um, but the clubs have also seen this now and they are doing everything in their power to fight these claims being uh, filed in the state of California. They are in effect, doing, they're, they're placing into the contract, into the standard player contract, a clause that says, if you play for the Kansas City Chiefs, you've got to bring your claim in the state of Missouri. And the same with Georgia for the Falcons, the same with the Saints in Louisiana. And the club has now uh, filed a grievance, and there have been some arbitration decisions that say, the arbitrator says, I don't know what state law says, but I know what this contract says. And that contract says that if you get hurt um, playing for the Chiefs, you've got to file that claim in Missouri. And the claim that you filed in California is out. That's being litigated. Um, I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that I have a magic uh, crystal ball that's going to tell you what the result is. Um, but I suspect that for the players in this room, uh, the, the provision in that contract is a relatively new animal. And I suspect that if you take out your old contracts, you won't find that provision. And that gives you the ability to go to Ron and 
file your claims in California, and I encourage you all to do that if you haven't. Um, you're entitled to it, it's the law, and there's absolutely no reason for you to do that. With that, uh, I thank you for your time, and I will turn it over to Ron Mix. Hello to everybody. Well, these, these uh, events where we get together, uh, uh, besides the fact that I think we join together in trying to accomplish something important, we get a chance to get to know each other better and better each time we see each other. Uh, I know I've had an opportunity to visit with, with Dave Pear and learn more and more about him. And, some of the things you might be interested in, you might not know, but he's not the only well-known person in his family. His great-great-great-great-grandfather, uh, Kevin Pear, in Ireland in 1626, invented the toilet seat. Now, about 20 years later, an Englishman improved on the design by cutting a hole in it. But <laughs> the important thing was it was Kevin's idea, and he was a hard-working man, he practiced thrift, hard work, he saved his money, he sent his son over to America, and there the Pear family thrived. Uh, they passed on this, this uh, work ethic and this thrift. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying uh, that uh, uh, Dave is cheap or anything, but it perfected it, so he is thrifty. And uh, one example, he, he got his uh, vasectomy at Sears. Now, I know he saved money, but now every time he gets excited, the garage door goes up. So it's just not worth it. All right, I better go on to other stuff. But in any event, okay, I know, you didn't, I know he didn't expect to get ragged on at his own convention, but man, those things happen. There's, you, know, you, you go to an event, you think it's going to be great, and you have a lot of fun. Two weeks ago, I went to a charity roast in San Diego, and I was the subject of the roast. And I was kind of flattered that they thought, oh, well, you know, that I could draw, I still had enough name recognition that I could draw a big crowd. And it was fun until, until my wife got up to speak, and then she started talking about personal stuff. She said, oh, I want to thank you for honoring my husband, Ron. He worked so hard to become a, a, a great football player. But that football must be really hard on the body. She says, I don't want to sound like I'm complaining, but uh, we have a waterbed, and I call it the Dead Sea. Uh, he is so awful in that department that uh, he was booed by a peeping Tom on our wedding night. You know, personal stuff. Why do that to it? Why do that to your husband? But in any event, we're, listen, we're here now. Uh, we're at the convention. We're here to talk about things that are going to help us move along, and uh, uh, we've made great progress. And two of the granddaddies of this entire movement uh, are here, and the Dave Pear, of course, but uh, Bruce Laird. Bruce, are you, are you still here? Bruce, stand up. If you don't know Bruce, there he is. <laughs> and truly, uh, until people like Dave Pear and Bruce Laird uh, got involved and started calling public attention to everything, we were absolutely getting nowhere. And some people criticize uh, Bruce, they criticize Dave, they criticize other people that are active in call, call, calling public attention to the, to the problems, and they say all they do is complain, they complain. Well, it serves a purpose because the public was not aware of it. Until the public became aware of what was going on, until they became incensed, until the newspapers and the various media got interested, until some of the higher profile players got interested, like Mike Gitta and, and with like people like Mike bold enough to step forward, uh, even though Mike Ditka was earning his primary money as an NFL announcer, he was bold enough to step forward and do what's right and start his own foundation and speak out on behalf of everybody and appear in Congress. Until that happens, <laughs> we were getting absolutely nowhere. So what you're doing by coming here 
what you're doing by supporting this organization, which is an extremely important organization because it is independent and it does hold the NFL to task. It does hold the Players Association to task. What you're doing is, you know what, you're benefiting yourself. And uh, we all like to think that when we come into this place, this world will leave it a little better for everybody else, for our family, for succeeding uh, generations, <clears throat> and you're doing that too. Now the California workers' comp system is rather unique. It's unique in this respect. <clears throat> it has a nuance to the statute of limitations that you were just told about. In California, we require that the employer give the worker written notice of his right to workers' compensation benefits. And if he fail, the employer fails to do that, I'm going to talk in terms of teams, but everything I'm telling you is workers' compensation that applies to every worker in America. The teams were obligated to give you written notice when they were where, you, where you're injured of your right to workers' comp benefits. And in California, if they didn't do it, and if you were also not aware of your rights, then the statute of limitations suspended until you find out. So based on that, since they never gave anybody any notice of their rights, and none of you learned about it, uh, based on that, we've been filing claims in California for guys who've been out of football 20, 30 years. Now, there's another part of California law that's very important, and that part of the California law is called your ability to recover for something called cumulative or repetitive trauma. And that, as you know, is nothing more than wear and tear over your entire career. It's not available in all states. It's not available in Missouri, for instance. It's not available in most states. And the truth is, the vast majority of your problems are not because you had a specific injury here and there that caused surgery. It's because you experienced wear and tear on your body, minute traumas that were cumulative in effect every time you ran, you jumped, you got a hit, you hit, you lifted weights. All of that contributed to early degenerative arthritis in all your joints, degenerative conditions in your spine, and brain damage. Any neurologist who is honest and objective will tell you that it doesn't take a diagnosed concussion or a series of diagnosed concussions to end up with permanent brain damage. All it takes is successive multiple hits to the head. Any neurologist who is honest and objective will tell you that every time you got stunned, saw stars, flash of light, shook it off, kept playing, you sustained what was called a low-grade concussion. I mean, we put on, in our, in our cases in California, in our case in California, I put on, like Nate Newton's case, I put on, for, for reasons that aren't important to go into, uh, his case goes, went to trial, most cases settle. But we put on evidence that based on the number of plays in a game, based on the number of uh, practice sessions and hits in practice, that Nate probably had 50,000 blows to the head during his career. And he also testified that the head was involved in probably 75% of those contacts. And all of you know that too. Even those of you who uh, aren't playing on the offensive and defensive line when your head is involved in almost every contact, uh, your head is involved uh, if you're a safety, if you're a linebacker, you're uh, a running back, your head is involved in, 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 in uh, contacts, many contacts, but even at a greater f velocity. I mean, uh, if you're a safety, you're really playing a high impact position because when you make contact, I'll bet there isn't a time uh, that a safety doesn't see that flash of light after, when he makes his hit. In any event, those are caused by cumulative trauma something that is not available in most states. It is available in California. So naturally, the, uh, we've been able to file these claims in California. Just a little more background information to tell you why this is such a big concern for the National Football League and all the teams, and actually all sports. I represent 
players from all sports. Um, the reason it's such a, a big concern is that California has what's known as a minimum contacts, minimum contacts requirement. And that is if an employee, a, an employer, employee or employer has certain minimum contacts in California, they can bring a claim in California even if they spent their entire career as a member of the Indiana, Indianapolis Colts. As long as the team came into California on a regular basis to play games, the, the employee, the athlete is considered to have been regularly employed in California. And think about it, he is regularly employed in California. It's a, a schedule devised by the league. It's required for the player to come into California. It's not like he can refuse and say, I don't want to go to in California. It's a league schedule. He regularly comes into California, plays games, practices. Dallas Cowboys hold their training camp in California. Players are taxed on their earnings in California. Uh, so California taxes them because California considers them to be employed in California. So at any event, so there are probably more cases filed in California than all other states combined. And uh, one of the main reasons is, of course, the statute of limitations because they're barred by the statute of limitations. So the reason why there's such a big effort by the league to have it ruled that a player who plays for Kansas City can only file in Missouri is it's not like there's a, a remedy for that player in Missouri because his statute of limitations has probably already run. So that's the reason why we, this whole entire system is under attack right now. Now, the benefits that are available have already been told to you. Um, uh, there's one more available in California. Bes uh, besides a tax-free cash award for whatever disability you have, uh, there is future medical care for life. And that's automatic for, for football-related problems. That's automatic. And then there's a also a possibility of a life pension. Life pensions are modest, but still there's a possibility of a life pension. Most players have a high enough disability that they qualify for a life pension. And again, I say they're modest. Depend, you're stuck with the benefits that existed at the time that you played. So the benefits were lower in 1980 than they uh, were in 1983, and they were lower in 1983 than they were in, I think the next big jump came in 1991. <clears throat> but so the pension benefits, they're always modest, but they'd range anywhere from 1,500 to maybe 9,000 9,000 a year. But still, it's a nice group of benefits. Now, here's how, they, here's how the, 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 the teams and the leagues are attacking. Um, they're attacking by inserting this clause. They started inserting this clause, just some of the teams, only about six teams, by the way, started inserting the clause in approximately the year 2000 up to the present time. And the clause that states, <clears throat> if you play for uh, a team, you must file your claim within that state. So that, uh, so there's only about six or eight teams that have that clause in. So it's not gonna, it doesn't impact the vast majority of players at this point. <clears throat> at this point in time, this is being litigated. The, the teams have won at the arbitration level. They've also won at the federal court level, but all these cases are, are currently on appeal to the dist federal district courts of appeal. And they well may go to they well may go to the Supreme Court. On the law, I won't get into it. I won't get into exactly why. I'm just telling you, based on the law, the the law alone, we should win. However, there's a different climate going on in the country now. There's an anti-union climate. There's a pro big business climate. There's a pro support of, of, of uh, big business in uh, the Supreme Court of the United States. 
Uh, on the climate level, we're a little concerned about. But on the law, if it's, uh, it's, uh, if it's just to the law, we should win on that. The next thing they're attacking is based on a thing called reciprocity. And that means if, a, if, a, if an employee is only temporarily in the state, and what they're attempting to do is there has a reciprocity agreement by one state along with another state. So, for instance, uh, recently Florida enacted a reciprocity agreement with California and said that any Florida uh, employee who is injured in California, if he's there on a temporary basis, um, uh, can only file his claim in Florida. Uh, and California has the same type of uh, agreement. Uh, there's only, now there's only about three or four states that have that <clears throat> agreement. Um, again, but that's for a temporary employee. Remember I told you we consider, and the state of California usually considers, that if you come into California on a regular basis, just like a truck driver, this law, this law developed from truck drivers who came into California as part of their regular routes. If you come in, we think, we don't think the reciprocity agreement will hold up, but that's another way that it's under attack. So they're also filing suits uh, against the players uh, just for filing a claim period if they don't have either of these other things. There's usually a provision in the contract, in all the contracts, not usually, it says uh, if there's any disputes under the terms of this contract, it should be uh, resolved according to the laws of wherever, Massachusetts, whatever. That provision, they're never going to win on. They're causing problems. They're never going to win on because that relates to contractual problems. Uh, they're trying to say it also relates to workers' comp problems, and it really doesn't. And, <clears throat> and we will win onto that. And by the way, you know, everything isn't purely black and white. The NFLPA is defending all of these at no cost to the players. And they're spending literally millions of dollars in attorney fees around the country to defend these. They hired outstanding, outstanding attorneys uh, to do it, and they're doing a great job. And if justice prevails, uh, we should win on those things. But it's, it is dangerous. If, if they don't win on them, every team in professional sports will start putting a clause in the contract that says, workers' compensation claims must be filed in the state where the team is located. It'll have nothing to do with you, it'll have nothing to do with players uh, <clears throat> who played before those type of clauses went in. Now, because <clears throat> these things can't, these laws can't be retroactive. I'm not certain, however, that current players really appreciate how important workers' compensation is. I'm not sure they really appreciate it. And here's why. They've got a terrific benefit now. They have free medical care, health insurance for everything for five years after they stop playing. In addition to that, they have accounts of up to 250,000 that they can access uh, their, their health accounts they, to pay medical bills and they could use that to buy health insurance. They probably think they got this thing covered. Workers' comp is not that important to them. They have no idea. They have no idea. Here's why. Workers' compensation, if you're covered by workers' compensation for a problem, there's no deductible. If you're covered by workers' compensation for a problem, there's no dollar limit. Every insurance policy has a deductible, I and mean, most say we'll pay up to 90% of the cost, and so you have to pay 10%. Some is more and more, it's getting larger, 20%. Uh, every insurance policy has a maximum. The vast majority is a million dollars. We'll pay up to 90%, up to a maximum of $1 million. <clears throat> and they think a million, million dollars is coverage. Well, that'd be great, except for one thing. The insurance industry has a history, not the workers' comp insurance industry, the, insurance, the health insurance industry has a history of denying coverage, refusing coverage if somebody has a pre-existing condition. The insurance industry has a history of when somebody makes a claim for, uh, 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 upon their policy, 
of then canceling the policy in the future. So that $250,000 in that account uh, that, could be, that theoretically could be used to buy health insurance is not going to buy health insurance. One illness, forget football, you know, the big dangers of the, bi the bigger things, uh, cancer, everything like that. One illness will wipe out that $250,000. So workers' comp is something that the current players will want to see protected. Let me see if there's anything else that's important. Ah, you know, this is kind of interesting. The fact that that players were not aware of their rights to workers' comp actually is a blessing in disguise. Here's why. Had they filed their claims, had they been informed and filed their claims when uh, they should have or could have, had they been aware of it, uh, their claims would have been worth far, far less. And the reason is every one of us in this room, because of the multiple hits you've sustained, have got a, a condition that's progressive. Degenerative arthritis is progressive. Some of you might just have an ache or pain right now and think, wow, I got out easy. But 10 years from now, because it keeps progressing, uh, you might need a hip replacement. You might need a knee replacement. So <laughs> had these guys filed their claims back then, they, wouldn't, they would have gotten a few thousand dollars. Now, because their conditions are much, much worse, uh, we're generally, depending on, depending on, on a lot of things, uh, the, their degree of disability, when they stop playing and everything, but uh, the claims are much, much more valuable. I mean, it's, it's, it's unusual if a, if a player played from 1984 to the present time not to uh, get the player in California something in the 100,000 plus range. It's unusual not to, get, not, to get, not to get that high. So it's really been a blessing in the skies. Uh, I had a basketball player client, made $19 million as a player and uh, was completely broke. And uh, <clears throat> you're familiar with the stories. Uh, the, the truth is that the vast majority of us came from uh, single family homes. There wasn't any business sophistication in the family. There wasn't any business sophistication in the circle of friends. Uh, we knew what it was like to be poor. And so we're, when we got our money, we we're overly generous with family or overly generous with friends. We weren't sophisticated. We got involved in bad deals. So uh, in many instances, life has not been kind to a post-career player. And uh, the workers' comp comes in and gives them a second chance. With the basketball player, he had 19, made 19 million, completely broke. His credit was so bad, he couldn't lease a car. He was renting one uh, from a cousin on a weekly basis. Didn't own a home. He did have years until you start drawing your NBA pension. But two months after he got his money, he called me up. He said, Ron, I just wanted to call you to thank you. He said, I took your advice. I, I, I found a house, it's 2,700 square foot home, nice area. It was in Monroe, Louisiana. Nice area, I paid cash for it, 125,000. I didn't follow your advice about the used car. I bought a new one, but I only spent 25,000 for it. He said, this is the first peace of mind I've had in years. We've had so many stories like that, <clears throat> that again, this whole thing, the, uh, this, the, the, this little evil that they perpetuated by not the, informing you, the players of their rights, came back to bite them in the butt and also came back to deliver a benefit to the players far greater than they would have had at the time. More importantly, it came at a time in their lives when they really needed it. If they had gotten the money a year after they stopped playing, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have meant anything to them. It wouldn't have meant a thing to them. But, but at this point in their life, it does. So if anybody hasn't filed a claim, first go to your personal attorney uh, and talk to that personal attorney about it uh, in your home state. Um, maybe talk to a workers' comp attorney.
attorney in your home state, see if you still have time to file a claim in that state. Uh, if you don't, there's uh, a, f uh, a few good attorneys in California that's very experienced with this stuff, and uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, they'll give you an interview. Let me just see if there's anything else that's important. I think that's it, so we'll probably...